That's good. I, uh, this morning, I again have the privilege of introducing Deidre Johnson, also informally known as Dee Dee Johnston. Uh, she's uh, been a faculty member at Hope College since 1994. And she also led the development of the college's peace and justice studies minor and chaired the Department of Communication from 2003 to 2010. Today, she's gonna to speak to us about temperance in conflict, fortitude and justice, very timely topic. Take it away, Dee Dee. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Susan. Um, we have a lot to talk about today. Good morning, half friends. I'm excited to be with you this morning. Um, I'm gonna power through some material and I'm just gonna stop when we hit 10 minutes before the hour so that we have some time to talk and process. So do send your questions to Judy and what we don't cover this week, we will see what we can pull in for next week. But um, yeah, I just found that I had too much to talk about. <laughs> That's a problem. So let me go ahead and get started with sharing my screen with you. Um, And here we are off and running. Um, so we are in the third week of a five week series where we've been looking at um, virtues as a framework and not just Christian virtues, but as we talked about on the first day, many of these uh, virtues originate with Aristotle um, as classical uh, virtues and with Pope Gregory in the sixth century. Um, and we've talked about courage to speak and humility to listen. We've talked about loving ourselves in order to love others. And today is perhaps no better time than this week to really start to lean into what it means to have temperance in conflict and fortitude in justice. Um, so temperance is the willingness to remain fully present and engaged through discomfort and offense calmly persevering with the knowledge that waiting is not merely doing nothing, but it is a persistent determination which reveals and stretches the ability to understand. So that's temperance and temperance, I don't know, I think it takes all the fun out of conflict, doesn't it? This idea of being patient and present and engaged even when it's uncomfortable. Um, and it speaks to a sense of calmness calmly persevering in the face of disagreement or discord. Fortitude, of course, is strength in the pursuit of justice for all peeping, people, even if that may be uncomfortable, difficult, or even dangerous to do so. Um, so what I wanna do today, I wanna start with a little meditation practice, and then we'll talk about what this means. So if you're comfortable, Close your eyes or at least let your vision uh, kind of go downward and, and soft, unfocused sort of vision. Um, get settled in your chair. Take in a big breath, a slow exhale just to center yourself. And I want you to imagine with me that the election outcome that we have just witnessed was the exact opposite. So imagine that the election outcome was the exact opposite. So imagine with me, you've just heard the news. It is final. Imagine yourself. What are you feeling? Meditate for a minute on these feelings. What are those feelings that you would be experiencing? Name the feelings. Doom. Identify how that feeling is experienced in your body. Is it in your stomach? Is it in the palms of your hands? Is it in your heart area? How is it experienced in your body? Is it with your mind racing of thoughts? So try to see yourself experiencing this news. Think about all your senses, what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like. And 
and take another big breath in, kind of recenter yourself, open your eyes, come back and, and join us together as a group. And the purpose of this exercise is a practice of empathy and imagining what each side in our country is experiencing. Okay, so on the one side, people are jubilant, euphoric, filled with joy, so exuberant and overwhelming that people took to the streets to celebrate. Their joy could not be contained within their family and friend groups, and they sought out public places to celebrate with family, friends, community, and even strangers. And on the other side this week, people are sitting at home, perhaps despondent, depressed, scared, angry, they feel cheated, they're afraid that their way of life is over, that America has lost her moral compass, that democracy is dead. So temperance in conflict requires us to reach across divides to experience the cognitive and emotional empathy. So I warned you this wasn't fun, right? So cognitive empathy is the mental perspective taking, trying to see the viewpoint of another person. Emotional empathy is trying to understand the feelings of another person, of what they are actually experiencing. And when we're in conflict and we're divided over some issue, that is the last thing we wanna do, right? But temperance in conflict calls us to do precisely this. And the third thing I would add to this in terms of temperance is thinking about common humanity. We have to be reminded of not what divides us, but also what unites us. So common humanity. And I've got a clip that I want to show you. Um, so bear with me on shifting a little bit. And I need... Susan to call out to me that she can indeed see my video screen. I can. Okay. Um, this is a clip from Danish TV produced this and I just really like it. I think we could all use it today. It's easy to put people in boxes. There's us and there's them. The high earners and those just getting by those we trust, and those we try to avoid. There's the new Danes, and those who've always been here. The people from the countryside, and those who've never seen a cow. The religious, and the self-confident. There are those we share something with, and those we don't share anything with. Welcome. Det kommer til at stille jer nogle spørgsmål i dag. Nogle af dem kan godt være lidt personlige, men jeg håber, I vil svare ærligt på dem. Hvem herinde i rummet var klassens klog? And then suddenly, there's us. We who believe in life after death. We who've seen UFOs. And all of us who love to dance. We who've been bullied. And we who've bullied others. And then there's us, the lucky ones who've had sex this past week. We who are broken hearted. We who are madly in love. We who feel lonely. Bisexual. 
and we who acknowledge the courage of others. We who have found the meaning of life and we who have saved lives. And then there's all of us who just love Denmark. So maybe there's more that brings us together than we think. TV2 Denmark. All. So this advertisement uh, or this uh, video produced by Denmark, I think reminds us of this common humanity that I want to elaborate on in a minute. Um, but before I do, I want to talk a little bit about the meditation exercise that we did is something that you can do as a practice to develop empathy. You can do it when you realize you're in conflict with somebody, but it's something that you have to practice over and over again. It has to be a discipline because it's not something that we do naturally to think about cognitive empathy, emotional empathy, and common humanity with another person, particularly when we're in conflict. So disagreement is inevitable. It's also a healthy way of life. It can open us up to new ways of seeing things, a new way of hearing, a new way of being. The trouble is that we don't know how to do disagreement very well. We either wallow in the warmth and comfort or I'm right and you're wrong, dualistic thinking, or we try so hard not to disagree that valuable information is forfeited for the sake of politeness. I want to share with you a quote from Paul Loeb, author of Soul of a Citizen, living with conviction in a cynical time. And he writes that once we've disagreed, we must venture into, quote, the difficult terrain where arguments are made, counter arguments exploited, explored, disagreements laid out, contradictions missed, hypocrisies confronted, where honest people have the, to face the possibility of something that changes their mind. So we need to see conflict as growth, conflict as opportunity. We need to lean into conflict. And right now it seems pretty impossible, doesn't it? In the, in the wake of the election and where we see the country right now. But I've seen this work. If it can work in Northern Ireland and bring Catholics and Protestants together in peace agreements, if it can work in South Africa after decades of apartheid and separation and segregation based on race, if it can work in other places of the world where people were divided by values and hate and they were even killing each other, I think we can do this in the United States, but it's going to take some work. There, um, I'm just going to digress just a little bit on the election and then we'll, we'll go on and move on to other things. And again, put your uh, questions in the comment section and we can talk more about this. Um, but political polarization, and we've all heard this, that has never been greater in our history in the divide. And, and certainly I think the election and um, the degree that so many states were too close to call initially has really brought this home to us, that we are a divided nation. But I want you to also think about and perhaps do a little background reading. This is a whole nother series, so we can't get into it in this class, but I highly recommend the book by Ezra Klein, Why We're Polarized. He also has a podcast. There are also videos online if you don't want to stag your way through the entire book. But he does a fantastic job of presenting research, research-based evidence for why we're polarized, where this came from. Um, and one of the things that I think we need to be aware of is how we are manipulated by political organizations. So there is actually research to show that if you are the Republican National Committee and you want to increase the number of people that donate to the Republican National Committee, if you wanna increase the number of people who will do your phone banks and knock on doors, you get a greater allegiance to your party in those actions when you demonize the other party. And likewise, if you're running the Democrat National Party and you want more money and you want more engagement and volunteer time from your base, the way you do that is you manipulate them and you demonize the other side. 
So they looked at messages where you said the Democratic Party is great and moral and good and we stand for these positions versus messages of the Republican Party is evil and demonic and we've got to stop them and they're out to get us, which generated the most money coming in, the allegiance from the members of the party, the hate rhetoric on both sides. Okay? So we've got very, very slick political operatives who are creating fear and fear gets people out to vote. Um, the other thing that they have done is made us believe that our positions on important issues are more divergent than they actually are. And again, a lot of research evidence for this. Um, that divides people and it divides people because we're being manipulated to be divided. The other thing um, Klein talks about so well in his book is how political identity has been collapsed. It's different than it was in the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 1990s, that you could have um, people who were Democrat and people who were Republican, and there was variance in terms of racial ethnic identity. There was variance in terms of socioeconomic identity. There was variance in terms of religious identity. And now we've collapsed political identity with as one identity that defines um, a primary identity and worldview of our lives. And when it comes down to one identity and you threaten that identity, people feel very, very threatened. There is also research that looks at civil wars around the world. And one of the things that happens is when identity becomes collapsed to one dimension, Catholics versus Protestants in Northern Ireland would be a great example of this people will fight each other because they have no other identity to connect upon. In an earlier time in US history, when I was growing up and a young adult, political identity did not wholly define you. And you, if somebody didn't agree with me on politics, they would agree with me on religion or they would agree with me on other issues. But now we've, we've had this identity collapse. Um, so temperance and conflict is getting the facts so that we know when our perceptions and positions are being manipulated. And I think this is so critically important as we engage this next stage. But again, I digress. Let's go back to temperance in conflict, although I think that does have something to do with the current state that we're in. So there is a destructive conflict cycle that we get into. Um, so neurologically, we are wired to fight the tiger. So when the tiger comes and we realize we are prey, we go to the hippocampus, a very um, um, early primitive part of our brain. And our brain goes into fight, flight, or freeze response. Okay. These neural pathways can be well worn. It takes a fifth of a second to activate them. So we're triggered by something and we go into fight, flight, or freeze, this immediate response. Once these neural chemicals, these stress hormones are dumped in our brain, it takes 20 minutes for our neurotransmitters to mop them back up again. So what happens is we're triggered by something. We go into attack mode or defend mode because the tiger is there, right? And then we look, oops, I guess that wasn't a tiger, but we somehow have to justify our response. We have to justify our emotional, angry outburst. We have to justify the zener, uh, humiliating thing that we said to another person. So we're in this state of having to justify what we just did when we went on this automatic kind of response when we're triggered by anger. The other thing that this neural pathway does is it makes us very vigilant for the next attack we're on edge and we're ready to, to fire that neural pathway again. So this idea of this very um, primitive, frankly, response to perception and in our life today, we're not typically fighting tigers. And so we don't need this response and we're given a prefrontal cortex, another part of our brain that we can activate if we learn and train ourselves to do so. So this hippocampus part of the brain, what it does is it narrows perception. This is fascinating and how true when we're in conflict that we can only think of the small issue in front of us, not the whole picture, not the big view of things. We narrow perception. And when there's a tiger in front of us or behind us tracking us, <laughs> we need to narrow our perception. That's evolutionarily very, very adequate and, and, and adaptive behavior for survival, right? That makes sense. But in 2020, when we're in a business meeting, or in a church meeting, 
or in a community town hall meeting, there is no tiger. But yet when we're activating that part of our brain, perception narrows. Our awareness becomes hyper-focused on our own security. I am under attack. I need to defend myself or attack back. Um, feelings drive fast responses, and the rational analytical part of our brain just lags behind. It's slower, okay? So the action reaction comes first, and then we try to justify our actions. There is another way. So we look at this constructive conflict cycle. We're triggered by something, but we've got to manage that response that's going to the hippocampus part of our brain. We breathe, we manage our heartbeat, we calm ourselves down for a minute and say, there's no tiger, there's no tiger, there's no tiger, I'm okay. I'm really not, my physical um, survival is not threatened here. I'm okay, there's no tiger. Then we can ask questions. We ask questions first before we go into our reaction. We ask questions of the person who has triggered us into this conflict mode. Then we listen, and we talked about that two weeks ago. We listen to what the other person is saying and what they're responding. We look for clarification. We reflect. This gives us a chance to articulate and to think about what do I stand for and what am I against? We reflect on what we've heard from this other person. We own our own contributions to this situation. Maybe we too are mutually responsible for the incident that caused the conflict. Maybe even if we didn't cause the conflict, our response to that trigger, we can claim responsibility for. Maybe that wasn't an appropriate response in order to have a productive um, response to conflict. And then only then, do we respond? So it's like a slow motion response of the brain where we're giving the prefrontal cortex, that rational analytical planning strategy, part of our brain, a chance to activate and respond before we respond to another person. Okay? And that takes some practice. And the first practice is at that very first stage when you're triggered of reminding yourself, there's no tiger. There's no tiger. I'm okay so that you can go through the steps of the process, ask questions, listen, reflect, own my own contributions to this situation, then respond, okay? Very different type of response. This also plays into emotional regulation and conflict, and I love this research. I just think it's really interesting that we can be in what's called a hyper-emotional state. This is when we're angry, and we're irritated and our heart is racing and our blood pressure is higher and, and we're in this agitated and we're frustrated and we have got a lot of energy and a lot of things firing in our brain all at once. And so you can see that graph line of a lot of ups and downs and, and irregular and fast frequency sorts of things happening in that hyper emotional state. There is also a hypo emotional state and that's when we withdraw. We close in. You can think of it metaphorically as going we into. We can't closing. hear you. Oh, goodness. What's happened? Let me stop screen share. Can you hear me now? I could hear you all along. What about the person who could not? Yeah, I could hear you as well. I can hear you now, but I. I think you unmuted you yourself. That's it. Okay. Are we all good? Yeah. I think okay. so. Gonna go back to share screen, yell out if you are having any troubles because I can't see all of you at once um, when I'm on the, the main screen. So this hypo emotional state is when you withdraw. Um, it might be depression, despondency, withdrawal. You go into the silent treatment when you're in conflict. You try to avoid the conflict. You sort of curl into yourself. So neither the hyper hyper or the hypo emotional states are a good place in which to engage and lean into conflict with another person. Neither one of those are functional states in which to lean into conflict. So we've got to find this zone of resilience, the wise mind, and I actually used a graph from an EKG there, <laughs> when your heart is beating the way that it's supposed to be beating, that you've got this, this moderation zone. Um, you're not withdrawn and you're not highly agitated. 
and you are leaning into that conflict with a steady persistence with, what is it? We just defined it earlier, temperance. That's temperance in conflict, is that middle zone where your wise mind is activating. So how do we get back to that middle zone? That takes practice, um, various ways. One is to um, manage your physiological responses with breathing and with relaxing and calming yourself. Another is even using um, prayer or meditation or positive images, something to bring you back into that middle zone. And then you can lean into conflict with temperance. Okay. So this cartoon, I like, it threw him off when I turned the other cheek. So then I hit him, okay? So this idea of turning the other cheek, um, I would say an old way of responding to conflict is to run away, to avoid, to freeze, to try to strike back, to try to assert your power over somebody else. A more productive way to lean into conflict is staying present, confronting, the issue at hand, engaging the other person, trying to engage through empathy, understanding their perspective, what they're feeling, receiving anger. That's an odd one, isn't it? Why would I put that on there? Receiving anger. What we know uh, from conflict research is that people get very angry when they feel that they have not been heard that they are not being heard, that no one is listening to them. Their anger will escalate and escalate. And that's why people yell. Right? That's why you yell when you're angry because you think the other person isn't hearing. So you're just going to drown out their voice and their thoughts and make them listen to you. So receiving anger is a position of temperance of saying, okay, you yell, you yell, I'm going to stand here. I'm going to listen to you yell. And then when you're done yelling and you've run out of things to say, then we can engage but I'm just gonna be here. And your anger, I'm not gonna take it on. It's not my problem. This is your problem that you're having to scream and yell. And I'm just gonna, it's not gonna affect me. I'm Teflon, it just rolls off, but I'm gonna just stand here. I'm gonna be present. I'm gonna stick with you while you vent. And then when you calm down, then we can deescalate and we can have a conversation about things, okay? So, and I would put in the caveat with this, that this idea of staying present, confronting a person over an issue, engaging conflict, receiving another's anger is only if you are safe in that position. There are certainly situations in which you are not safe to stay present and you just need to get out of there to protect yourself and not engage a person who's completely out of control. So I recognize that. But in general, for most instances where we find ourselves engaged in conflict, whew, to just stay present, confront it, engage it, wait for the person to ventilate all they have to scream about, and then de-escalate. Okay. So we've got a new way of engaging conflict, of leaning into conversations, and I'm going to go through several today. We'll see how we're doing on time. Looks like pretty well so far. Um, ways to lean into conflict. And in fact, I've got 10 ways. We'll see if we can do this. So the first one is recognize identity threats. And this is my number that I just made up, but I believe this, that about 90% of conflicts are originate in identity threats. Somebody's identity has been threatened and that's why they react. And when our identity is being threatened, you think, my gosh, why am I so angry over this thing that happens? Backtrack. How was my identity threatened? So three primary types of identity. One, that you're competent or you're incompetent. Two, that you are a good or bad person, the meaning in morality. You are a good moral person or you are a bad and evil person. And third, your lovability, that you have social worth. You are lovable or you're unlovable. So when we criticize another person, we are often attacking one or more of those kinds of identities. So if I criticize my partner's driving, I'm threatening his competence, right? He gets angry and irritated. Shouldn't be a surprise to me. If I challenge my sister's views on nearly any political social issue, she is threatened 
that I am saying she's not a good person. She is not a good and moral person. If I recommend my dog for barking, my dog feels that I've threatened her social worth, that she is worthy of love, right? How could you possibly be angry with me as a dog owner? You have threatened my sense of worthiness and lovability, okay? So almost any conflict we have goes back to these threats to identity. And when your identity is threatened, your response is you want to lash out, you want to defend yourself, and that is not going to get us to a productive conflict cycle. So I'm going to um, show you a little clip here. It's kind of a fun one to look at and look for in the clip, um, the identity threats. Okay, you seeing my screen on the video clip, yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Hi there. Hi. Nice day, huh? Yeah, finally, right? Where are you from? Your English is perfect. San Diego. We speak English there. Oh, uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> where are you from? Well, I was born in Orange County but I never actually lived there. I, uh, I mean, before that. Before I was born. Yeah, like, well, where are your people from? Well, my great-grandma was from Seoul. Korean. I knew it. I was like, she's either Japanese or Korean, but I was leaning more towards Korean. Amazing. Yeah. I'm Shasina. There's a really good teriyaki barbecue place near my apartment. So I actually really like kimchi. Cool. What about you? Where are you from? San Francisco. But where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm just American. Really? You're Native American? No, uh, just regular American. Oh, well, uh, I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, well. people's fish and chips are amazing. You're weird. Really? I'm weird? Must be a crane thing. Wait for my screen to catch up with me for a minute. There we go. We are back again. So um, this particular clip is a sample of microaggressions, uh, what we call these little micro insults that can have a really big impact on the recipients of those insults um, that happen a lot, particularly when we target people um, of um, racial and ethnic and sex and almost any other social identity um, that you have microaggressions that are associated with that. But back to our idea of these recognizing identity threats. So why are these statements hurtful? Why are these microaggressions hurtful? Well, first of all, he's threatened her competence that she can't speak English right from the beginning, right? And speaking very slowly to her like she can't speak English, okay? Secondly, he's threatened her sense of inclusion as an American citizen by implying that she's not really American or she's not as American as he is. And then he's um, threatened by, by suggesting this kind of false compliment, false good, your people's food is good. Not she is a good person, not seeing her in any three-dimensional way in terms of who she is and how she identifies and what her interests are and all the things that comprise her being, but your people's food is good, is a kind of false compliment about whether or not that she is lovable or unlovable. So we see these threats to identity and that's why um, those are particularly problematic. 
I want to give you another way of leaning into conflict, and that is paying attention to nonverbals. Um, so you see in this example what we call mirroring, and it's really kind of funny, isn't it? So when people are connected to each other, when they are in relationship with each other, when they're feeling that connection between two people, they will mirror each other's nonverbals in positive ways. So it's almost comical, isn't it? The fact that they have their jackets slung over each of their outside shoulders as they walk along, that the hands are placed on the knees and they have almost exactly the same posture and pose. The problem is that when we're in a conflict, situation, you do not want to mirror the person who is in conflict. We want to engage something we call reverse mirroring. So you do whatever the opposite is of what the person who is angry is doing. So if the angry person is standing up and you are in a safe space, you sit down. If you were to stand up also, that's going to escalate them so that the conflict escalates, their reaction escalates. If the person is speaking very, very rapidly because they're very, very angry and they want this point to get across to you, then you speak in response very slowly. If the person is using a tone of voice that's very strident and very enunciated, you use a soft tone of voice and a, a smooth enunciation that is calming. Okay, so this idea of reverse mirroring is a very powerful way to de-escalate conflict. And then when we lean into the conflict, once we've de-escalated, we can have a conversation about these things. Another one um, way to lean into conflict is to validate another person. You validate another person with whom you disagree. How on earth could I suggest such a thing, right? Well, you don't have to validate the person's position. You don't have to agree with their position. You're being absolutely honest and authentic here. You're validating them as a person. You're validating the feelings that they are having in this moment. So for example, you have strong faith convictions. I admire how important faith is to you as you struggle with this issue. Or you have great courage to stand up for your convictions and let us know what you think about this issue. I'm not agreeing with their position, but I'm authentically, honestly validating them as a person, their feelings, their communication. Another one, you're very passionate about this issue. I'm validating their feelings. Another, you seem very frustrated or sad or angry, whatever it might be, about how we have responded to this issue. Is that correct? Okay. So it's a way of validating with, again, complete sincerity, authenticity, honesty, validating the person, validating their feelings, and you don't have to compromise your own position and say that you agree with something that you don't agree with. Okay. Another um, way of leaning into conflict is to find the third path. Okay. Um, if you remember that dot puzzle where you're given nine dots and you're supposed to connect them all with four straight lines without lifting your pencil off the table. Remember this one? And the only way you can connect that with four lines is to go outside of the box. That outside of the box kind of thinking. And we struggle with that again. Remember the first time you did that puzzle and you struggle and you struggle because you don't think that you can go outside the box. You can go outside the line. But in conflict, this idea of finding not your side, not my side, but a third path a third dimension that we can um, address. And in demonstrating this one, I love the parable of Jesus with the woman caught in adultery who is being stoned. I think this is just a brilliant example of finding the third path. So he comes across the crowd, they're throwing rocks at this woman uh, who's been accused of adultery. And so what is, what's Jesus gonna do in this situation? Does he quench the angry mob's thirst for justice and punishment? and join in them and start throwing rocks and yelling? Does he free the woman, realizing the hopes of her family for forgiveness and compassion? Doesn't do either of those things. He neither turns or aligns himself with the crowd or with the woman, but instead he finds a third path. And the first thing he does is distraction to the crowd to deescalate where he takes a stick and starts writing symbols in the dirt that nobody can figure out exactly what he's writing and what he's doing. So distraction helps to kind of deescalate. 
And then he introduces a third option, directing the crowds to focus on their individual self-awareness and humility. Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. Third path. Definitely third path solution. So when we're seeking the third path, it's often helpful to take agreement off the table. We don't have to agree on this. Let's just try to understand each other. And you take winning off the table. We're not talking about you win or I win or you lose or I lose. We're going to take that off the table. We're just focusing on understanding. Okay. Another um, way of leaning into conflict is this practice of empathy. Um, this book, Cultivating Empathy by Walker, is a short pa paperback, maybe 100 pages, um, where he talks about a daily discipline and practice of developing empathy. Um, and I just highly recommend it as a good read. But he talks about when we find ourselves being defensive and you find that trigger, you're triggered physiologically, your heart rate goes up, you're, you start to, your palms start to sweat, you're getting a little agitated, that you go, whoops, wait, identify that, I'm getting defensive here. How can I replace that with curiosity? By asking questions and trying to understand this person. Okay, so you take the, the focus off of yourself and your own physiological response, and you send that out to curiosity about the other person. So taking that third person viewpoint where you're looking at the conflict from the bird's eye view is neither role. You're seeing yourself as a, a, a subject in a video that's playing out of this conflict, but you're not seeing yourself in your own eyes and viewpoint at that point. You're trying to see the whole picture. Um, and he also talks a lot about reminding himself always that what is the difference between my response and the person I want to be? And I love this because I think it's just a good thing to remember. Huh, am I being the person I want to be here? And I have to admit that sometimes um, during the process of this election, my thoughts about people on the other side of the election than what I wanted, I had bad thoughts and I'm not proud of that. But I try to catch myself and think, what kind of person do I want to be? I don't want to be that kind of person that thinks negative thoughts about another side. Okay, So what is the person that I want to be? Um, another way of leaning into conflict is moving from blame to mutual contributions. Ooh, this is tough stuff, isn't it? What are you telling me that I'm partly responsible? I would say venture a guess that in any conflict, there are mutual contributions, right? We can certainly see it in other people's conflicts. We just can't see it in our own. So trying to identify um, mutual contributions. So bearing witness to the story of the other person and listening, trusting the experience of another, having the wisdom to thoroughly and explore our own contributions to the conflict, our own contributions, and they've got to be sincere. Um, so I was reading an article in the last week or so that said the, the six words that are most common for a person who does not demonstrate or communicate empathy is, sorry you feel that way. That's not empathy. <laughs> That's all about you. That's not owning your contributions. It's like your feelings are your own fault. They're not mine. Um, so this idea of trying to move from blaming another person to really reflecting on how have I also contributed to the situation that we find ourselves in. Walter Wink, some of you may be familiar with. I love his uh, books. Again, short paperbacks, highly recommended. They're older, but they are just packed full of really good stuff. But he talks a lot about, he's writing about South Africa as an American theologian. And he, um, at the time of apartheid, um, and he talks about, about reflecting on our own anger and reflecting on our discomfort with others' anger. So sometimes we're so uncomfortable with another person expressing anger or expressing any other negative feeling um, that we don't, we aren't present for that. We can't be practice temperance. We can't stand with that person as they're going through this uncomfortable emotion. And he talks a lot about that importance. Again, that temperance is being present, being engaged even when it's uncomfortable, calmly persevering in the face of conflict. So I've got a uh, fun clip that I want to show you here. So bear with me. Okay. 
Hey, everybody seen my video screen. Somebody Let's yell see. out to me. Yes. yes. Yes, thank you. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop then, trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine, I will listen, fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. <laughs> Okay, get back to our slide here. I love that clip. So the point um, for me, including that today, is just to get us to think about self-awareness. Um, reflect on our self-awareness. What is our distress tolerance? Can I sit with my own discomfort? Um, Resilience, can I take an accusation anger and reset my temperance? Emotional regulation, can I remain patient? Can I separate my ego from the situation? Can I maintain my focus on the other person's needs in that moment? And then reflecting on our awareness of others. What does another person say that they need versus what we think they need? Do we respect those wishes? Um, and then this calls us to think about boundaries. When is it or is it not our place to point out the nail that's in her head, right? When is it our place to do so? So I think it just calls us to attention as we think about temperance, being present, being calm, persevering in the face of conflict and anger. That sometimes we know, we think we know that the whole uh, problem is that person and the nail in their head and we try to tell them that it's their fault, it's their nail in their head. Sometimes we may be right and sometimes we may be very, very wrong. So that reflecting on our own anger, reflecting on our own um, role of how we should respond to another person, when to uh, cross boundaries, when not to, and then if, turning that reflection back to us on are we responding and respecting what another person needs in the moment. Um, so we're down to number two for doing well. We're well, look at this. 10 ways of leaning into conflict. Um, another is nonverbals um, and thinking about your own nonverbals in conflict. So when you are crossing your arms, I don't know how well you can see me, that you cross your arms in front of you is a sign of that you need to protect yourself, that you're defensive and frankly, that you're closed to listening really to another person's position, okay? Um, closed fists are another example. Even if you're sitting in a chair and your hands are by your side, if your fists are closed, that's a closing off to another person. And even though we don't cognitively, consciously register all of these cues in another person, subconsciously, it all goes into how we respond and what we think they're thinking. So crossed arms, crossed legs, power stances. This is the ultimate power stance. The hands laced behind the head, the chin up. Often you think of this, you think of somebody sitting in a chair this way, right? Their legs are extended and spread apart, right? It's a power dominance move. 
It's I am powerful over you. Um, lack of eye contact it can also um, be a signal of I don't want to listen to you. I don't even want to look at you. You so irritate and disgust me in this moment. Um, and we've talked a bit before about eye contact and honoring another person and how that, that gaze is important. One way to um, recognize, for example, in marital counseling, when two people are really not getting along and there are really serious relationships and divisions is that they cannot maintain on eye contact with each other. That's one of the indicators that, that therapists look for, that lack of eye contact. Um, so what do we do? What are the positive behaviors for, uh, for practicing temperance in conflict? One is to lean in to the other person. So if you're sitting in a chair, lean forward in your chair. Decrease the distance between you and the other person. Try to take an open posture of open arms, open legs as much as possible, not a closed off posture. If you turn your lips ever so slightly to a smile, and again, you don't want to do this wrong where you come off looking like you're mocking the other person, but just a slight, slight smile, that too is a way of de-escalating the other person. It's a way of connecting with them and de-escalating in the face of conflict. Okay? So there are many more. Those are just a few things to think about um, as your own Nonverbals can play into conflict in ways that can escalate a conflict. The last one, how many of you, when you first looked at that, thought you saw a gorilla on the beach, right? Um, it's not actually a gorilla. It is a man fishing with a fish before him on the beach that he's oh. looking. Oh. <laughs> yes. You got it. Um, so these manufactured optical illusions are typically both and. You see the vase and the two heads, right? You see the gorilla and now you see the, the man on the beach in his head. Um, a photograph, an actual photograph is typically either or if it's not this sort of optical illusion. But it's important to recognize this either, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, it's important to recognize the both and opportunities when we are in conflict of saying not that I'm right, you're wrong, but both and. We both have some, carry some truth and we both have some things that simply aren't valid. Okay? Both and. Um, that if you look at any political position right now that divides us, if we're gonna solve some of these problems, we've got to be doing some both and thinking. It's not either or, it's not dualistic. Frankly, the world is not that simple to come up with an either or solution. We've got to be thinking both and, and it just expands the range of possibilities um, that happen. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was brought into another university on the East Coast and they had a, um, the, department that was completely in conflict. And um, I was brought in as a consultant to work with the conflict. And there were uh, the, or, the origin of the, the conflict that divided the entire department was around two women in the department. And one woman claims that the other woman came into her office and said something derogatory to her in front of a student. And the other woman claims that in response to that, this other woman slammed the door of her office in her face, slammed the door in her face. Both of them denied doing the actual behavior that provoked the other person. Of course, I didn't slam the door in her face. Of course, I didn't say that derogatory thing in front of a student. I would never do that, right? Both of them denied it. So I come in as the consultant. They're both looking at me to align with one or the other of them, which is what has happened with the whole rest of the department has fallen into two camps and they're all fighting each other now because they've aligned with one or the other person in this conflict. And I worked with them on trying to think of both and. I believe that the woman who thinks that the door was slammed in her face, she thinks that the door was slammed in her face. I don't believe she's lying, but I'm not sure that the door was slammed in her face. And frankly, it's not really that important. It's the perception that's important. I believe that the woman that thinks that the, the other said a derogatory uh, um, statement to her, I believe she thinks that is true. I don't think she's lying about that. I don't know whether it was said or not, but I know she believes it was said. So let's work with their beliefs 
and not who said, she said, he said, they said, um, that's not gonna get us anywhere. That just gets in us in a spiral. And think about both and. What if both of these things are true and how do we move on from that? Because both of them are true in the minds of the receiver. Um, so most interpersonal and social community conflicts are both and, but there are ways of looking at recognizing that both sides hold some of the truth. Um, and, okay, I'm going to spend just a few minutes on um, fortitude and justice, and then we'll, we'll spend a little time talking and processing today. Um, so this idea of fortitude, strength in seeking justice, why justice? Um, I would argue that what is civility without justice? We, we can't have civility without justice. Those two are, go hand in hand um, if we're really looking at true civility. And there are various um, definitions of justice and the philosophers debate and argue this through the centuries about exactly what justice is. And everybody has their favorite definition. And I'm gonna pick one and it may not be yours, but it's one I'm gonna go with. And that is um, equity. That justice means providing for people what they need. And the difference between equity and equality on the left side of your screen is just a simple visual that reminds us that equality is giving everybody the same thing. But that really doesn't help the, and that's me there on the right, the short one, because I'm particularly short. <laughs> that's me that's not able to see over the fence and I want to see the game too. So equity is giving people what they need to bring everybody up to the same level on the fence so we can all see and enjoy the ball game. Okay. So, and then community restorative justice. What does it mean to bring offenders and victims in the community together where um, there are options for some types of crime where offenders can be brought in to do restorative work in the community to restore reconciliation as a being in right relationship with other people. So how do we bring the offender, the victim, and the community together in reconciliation, right relationship with each other? That is justice. Um, and there are ways in which... Um, we don't engage justice. So this was after the Trayvon Martin um, shooting. And you see this group of people with hoodies on at the top of the picture. And the headline now, do we look suspicious? This is the Howard University Medical School student body. Once they're wearing white coats, don't look so suspicious, right? And it makes a powerful point about presumptions and stereotypes uh, that we have, same people, wearing hoodies versus wearing white coats for doctors. So fortitude and justice, strength in seeking equity and restorative justice is about moving from dehumanizing acts to rehumanizing acts. So um, rather than stereotyping and making assumptions and responding to other people with resentment, anger, and fear that further divides us, and you can look at this in, in the recent political election, rehumanizing means focusing on individuals, really getting to know people for who they are beyond labels. Um, so if somebody's on another political party that is not your own, do you really know them? Or have you labeled them and made assumptions about them? Um, responding with curiosity of trying to understand another person, another group more fully and responding with empathy, which we've talked about today. These are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, 17 goals to transform our world. And I encourage you to look at these and to look them up. You can just Google UN Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. And I think these are a good pathway, a good map, if you will, for what justice might mean in our world, um, where we really to try to meet the basic needs of the population of the world. Zero hunger, no poverty, adequate health care, and education. These are basic things that we should be able to provide. And that to me is fortitude, strength, and justice. So in summary, um, we've talked a bit about justice today, briefly, that to stand up for justice, defend the rights of others, speak with other people who may be the targets of injustice, promoting equity and restoration, that restorative justice notion, um, work on rehumanizing 
the focus on people with curiosity, with empathy, um, finding your action. How can you act in your fortitude, your strength for justice? Strength in the pursuit of justice calls us to give our time, our money, our gifts um, in the pursuit of justice. And we also talked about conflict and we talked about stopping that cycle of destructive conflict and thinking about both and possibilities, that expanse of thinking rather than either or that gets us into trouble. We talked about turning the other cheek, exploring mutual contributions to the conflict. We talked about identity threats, how that's the origin of so much of the conflict conflict that we experience. You're either saying I'm incompetent, you're saying that I'm not a moral good person, or you're saying that I'm unlovable, not worthy of love, and that we need to be responding with empathy um, to others, even when we find ourselves in conflict with them. And then um, I didn't talk about this one as much today, this idea of impact over intent, but to look at the impact of our actions rather than trying to justify our intentions. Um, and validating and de-escalating conflict to the point that we can actually have a conversation. So there's several things we talked about that really require practice. To practice temperance, it's not something that comes automatically. So how do we practice cognitive and emotional empathy by really meditating on what are the perspectives and what are the feelings of the other person on the other side of this conflict with me? Trying to moderate, find that wise mind, that, that, that place of resilience and emotional moderation that we're not hyper aroused and we're not hypo aroused because neither of them are productive for leaning into conflict. We talked about nonverbals. We talked about that reflective, constructive conflict cycle, using our prefrontal cortex, slowing down our response in response to a trigger in order to have more uh, constructive conflict. We talked about validating people with whom we disagree to validate them as people, even if we disagree with their, their positions doesn't mean that they are a bad person. So we validate them as people and we separate the person and the position so that we can talk about the position. Um, looking for that third path and both and thinking. So all of these are things that we need to practice. So I'm gonna give you your homework assignment for this week and then open things up for discussion. So there's something called nonviolent communication, the NVC model. It's gonna tell you about this in four easy steps. And there's much more to this if you're interested in looking up and, and um, learning more about it. But the idea is that when you find yourself, even in the smallest conflict to the biggest conflict, this practice is incredibly powerful four sentences that you use. One, you try to state an observation of the situation as descriptively and non-evaluatively as you can, just an objective observation. You can do that in one sentence. You identify, how does this make you feel or me feel? How do I feel in response to the, the situation I've just described? What do I need? So often in intimate relationships, we make people guess what we need. I can't believe they didn't figure it out. Well, you never said what you needed <laughs> in the first place, but we always hold our intimate partners accountable for this. They should have known. They should have known that we were hungry. They should have known to stop the car at the rest stop. They should have known that we don't express our needs clearly, and it's just not fair in relationships. And the fourth is a request. So let me give you a simple example. Um, so I've let my uh, husband know that I use this example when I do these presentations and he's only slightly irritated that I use this in him as an example. But so we've been married over 30 years. Um, he has a habit of getting up before I do in the morning and he eats his breakfast cereal and he leaves that bowl on the dining room table with the dried cereal drying like cement to the side of the bowl. Description. Jim, when I get up in the morning, I see a bowl left on the dining room table with cornflakes stuck to the side of the bowl. Description, observation. Second sentence, I feel irritated, angry even. Second sentence. Third sentence, in the morning when I wake up, I need a gentle introduction to my day. I need to be able to stumble to the coffee pot unimpeded, get my coffee, get my things organized to get ready to go to work and get out the door without in, get calm. I need a water birth entrance to my day. Request or sentence. Jim, when you are done with your breakfast, can you pick up the bowl and put it in the sink with some water or even in the dishwasher? 
observation, feeling, need, request. You can do this in four sentences. So this week, I want you to practice this. Look for an opportunity to use this. The most objective observation, and the key is it can't be evaluative. It can't be you leave your bowl on the breakfast table. And, um, it's got to be, I, I find a bowl on the breakfast table, okay? Objective as possible, four sentences. Okay, let me stop sharing at this point, come back to where I can see you. And let's take a few minutes to talk about whatever you wanna talk about. So sure I, would, I would suggest you raise your hand perhaps and then get called on because we're a pretty large group. Do you, uh, of course, no, a lot, most of us are, 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 I can't see. So just blast right away. <laughs> Comments. Just make sure you unmute your mic. If you have a little red uh, slash through, it means we can't hear you. What do you do when you're by yourself so you don't really have someone to interact with during this time of isolation? Makes it a little bit more difficult to do my homework exercises, doesn't it? I think this was brought up last yeah. week as well. Um, maybe even in telephone conversations or in writing. Uh, with something that has come up in uh, a relationship. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And feel free to send uh, questions on the chat to Judy and she will monitor those. And we can talk about things from previous weeks um, we can be really brave and practice our temperance and dive into election issues and your feelings, anxieties, concerns, and we, as we find ourselves in the aftermath of um, this election. So I think I heard you say no civility without justice. Is that what you had said? Yeah, I think I did say that. Yeah. So <laughs> So does that mean that there has to be justice between the two people or justice in society as a whole or, or what? What do you really mean by that? What do I really mean by that? That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, I think that if we think of civility without justice, if I imagine that, I think of a cheap artificial type of civility? How can I truly be caring about other people or society if I am also not in tandem pursuing justice? So am I, am I civil? Am I just polite? Um, but there's really no justice that walks hand in hand with civility. So you can certainly think of other countries with very authoritarian governments um, where there is civility in society that's practiced but to me, if there's not justice that goes hand in hand with that, I see that as a sort of fake civility. And I hesitate to, to use a particular country as an example, but just for the sake of an example, I will and, and I'll, it'll get me into trouble inevitably. But um, if you look at China and their communication in China, it's all about how do we um, maintain a harmonious society and you see this in propaganda on billboards in China. In fact, when I was in Hong Kong at the height of the uh, riots and protests in Hong Kong, the Chinese government was coming in and putting up these harmonious society billboards. Um, but it was fake. It was fake. It wasn't real. It wasn't a harmonious society. It was being used to try to, civility was being used to try to cover up real needs of the people that were not being heard in those protests. So to me, that becomes a, a sort of fake civility. And, and that stark contrast was just palpable to me by walking past a billboard and over here on the other side, a block away are people on the street being tear gassed by the authorities. Um, I actually was right in the middle of this. It's fascinating time to be in Hong Kong. Um, so likewise in interpersonal relationships, I think that just being, sometimes we can get away and say that we're practicing civility and we're just being polite. But if we're being polite, 
without authentic empathy and care for the equity and well-being of another person, for justice for another person, I don't think that's real civility. I think it's I think it's fake. So does that help clarify? Yes. Yes, that it does. And, and and it, use... a, a more a more uh, close to home example, would you consider so-called Midwestern niceness as that kind of civility that doesn't necessarily have justice tied with it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So we um Wait, this is telling you uh, have question and answers. You get me into a dangerous spot. I'm telling all the stories, <laughs> all, all the family secrets. So at Hope College, in my time at Hope College, over a number of years, we had um, students and faculty and staff crying out for justice, racial justice at Hope College as one example of that, where it was not an equitable, fair community and environment for all of our students. They were not treated fairly. And they were crying out and they were saying, do you see what's happening to us? Do you see how we're being treated? Um, can somebody respond? And at times in our hope history, we squashed those voices and said, oh, can't you just be more polite? Can't you just be a little more civil? You had a march? How dare you have a march to draw attention to this? This, this is suggesting civil unrest on our campus. We're going to take away your protest signs and we're going to put you through the student um, uh, judicial system so that there are punishments actually for engaging in protests to try to bring your voices to light about what you are experiencing. That to me is a great example of Midwestern nice, well can't we all just get along, sometimes covers up the voices of the marginalized and, and allows injustice to continue. Thank you. Tim. Kathy, it looks like you're trying to say something. Are you going to unmute yourself? Kathy Beal? Sorry, sorry, yes, I did. Okay, how do you uh, respond graciously and think this through, don't pounce, etc., and not have that be confused with, I agree with you? My silence says, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, uh, I believe what you're saying is, is what I think too, and it's not at all. Yes. Very good question, Kathy. So I think sometimes we can think of temperance in conflict being perceived as weak. Mm -hmm. But I think if we really look at what's called on us to do in temperance is not a position of weakness, but a position of incredible strength. And I think you see that, I mean, maybe on the bigger scope, when you think of Gandhi and MLK, um, that temperance in conflict, the persevering. So you're going to get a chance to challenge this person's perspective, but you're going to do it once you get to both of you in an emotional place where you can have a conversation, you can have a dialogue about it. And it's not um, throwing zingers at each other to try to knock the other person off their pedestal. Um, so sometimes you have to be patient and in that temperance and stay with, persevere. But it's not that you don't have an opportunity to, to say, wow, now I've heard, and if I'm hearing correctly, you are saying your position on this issue is this, and it is because of this experience in your life that you have this position on this issue. So I've, I've, I've heard that. Well, I need to explain my position is completely different. I see this from a different viewpoint, and here's how I see this position. But I don't think you can get there until you've taken some time for understanding and listening. Because as long as a person feels that they have not been heard, they're going to escalate, they're going to yell, they're going to throw zeners out, they're trying to impose their viewpoint on you, um, and it's not going to be a condition for productive dialogue. That makes sense? It makes sense. I hear you. I, I, I'm afraid there's a lot of situations where you never get beyond the first point. And so therefore the other person goes away thinking, oh yeah, uh, uh, we had a good conversation and I've got that person on board and it's not an accurate perception. Yeah, 
And maybe that perseverance in the, the definition of temperance, that you don't allow that conversation to end with, well, perhaps we're out of time, but I'm afraid you didn't get a chance to hear my perspective okay. on how my perspective differs from yours. So we need to continue this conversation even at a later date yeah. um, so that you don't leave it out there that you're feeling, then you feel like you haven't been heard and right. that they have misunderstood your position. So, so yes, I think you're absolutely right. You've got to get that in there, even if you don't at that moment have a chance to fully expand upon your position, at least clarify, I'm not agreeing with your position on this. And I really would look forward to a time to be able to explain my perspective and how it differs. Mm -hmm. To Thanks. carry that point a little further, um, you're having a conversation and it's civil. At what point does that, is it okay for that conversation to stop? I've spoken my position, he or she has spoken theirs. We disagree. Mm -hmm. When, you know, how's a good way to stop there and say, I heard you, you heard me without having to go continue talking until you give up yeah. by your silence or just privately in your head saying, okay, okay, fine. Yeah. There may With be, yeah, there may be an opportunity uh, for a conversational shift to say, okay, I've heard your position. You've heard my side of this position. Is there any where, place where we share some of the same values or perspectives? What do we both think are important? Um, what do you think, uh, uh, there's some kind of question prompts that are sometimes helpful with, what do you think is the strongest point of my position? What do you think is the weakest point of your position? I mean, if you can get to a point where you can really explore that, that reveals a great deal and sometimes reveals where there is some sort of common ground where we can do some both and thinking around this. Sometimes you are gonna encounter people that there is no common ground. You're just not gonna find any. At which point I think you have to say, it's been really helpful to me to learn about your position and to understand where you're coming from. I have to honestly, authentically disagree that for me, this is my position and we're gonna to have to agree to disagree. Um, but, but to not go there too quickly and to think about, are there any both and connections that can come out of this? And it takes time, it takes time. And that's the hard part of it. There's no fast fix for this. It takes time, that perseverance in temperance. Thank you. I have a question that's submitted uh, by Joyce. How do our values relate to the differences we perceive in others? And should they, the values, be more or less important than in our interactions? I mean, how, if, if we see difference, but yet we have a value that maybe sees that difference, uh, the, the other point of view, as, as less or more or good or bad, how, how do our values and differences work together? Hmm. I think it's important to be authentic to yourself and with other people to say and identify different values that you hold. I think it is a step in understanding when we can, if we find a value that is just diametrically opposed to us, to ask questions of the other person and say, what experiences have you had that have led you to value this? to this particular value or this particular position. And that tells us a great deal. So we're really trying to understand um, how the person got to that place, what experiences in their life got them to the place where we encounter this conflict of contesting values. Um, I had another thought and it just escaped me. So values, differences. Maybe I can just add to that because I have found that my values are what places a barrier between me and other people. 
because I think what we act on is based on our values. But I have had other people, even friends say, values are just not that important. Well, to me they are, and how do you get beyond that values as the barrier? Can you state specific values that, that you can think of when you're talking about this? A name of value, for example, that, that causes uh, a disagreement. Um, how we perceive it. the need to help other people and other people meaning not just our friends, our family, but people, you know, in the world. Um, it's a big value. It's like, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we help others? And, um, and I see a difference between people who perceive themselves as Republicans versus Democrats saying, you know, some seem to be more concerned with how do I help myself and those that are most close, the closest to me versus others saying, you know, how can I help people who haven't had the same opportunities that I have? Mm -hmm. Those are tough. Um... And I think, I, I mean, the first, the first, the last step, both steps have to be having communication and unpacking those values. And there um, are processes where you can ask questions to take people, have them go through a kind of step by step by step how they got to a particular position or point. Um, and once you start to unpack that, it brings it out in the open for reflection, for critical review. And sometimes um, people change once they have to really unpack it and think it through. I think part of our problem is that we, the world is complicated and the issues it faces are so complicated and so complex. And we look for very simple little soundbite positions that we can grab onto. Um, so I embrace environmental sustainability. I don't know that much about environmental sustainability. I don't know how to solve the problem, but yes, that's a value I hold and I'm going to cling to that and I'm going to defend for that and I'm going to try to vote for things for that. But do I really understand that? So we've got to start unpacking some of these values and some of these positions and see what really underlies um, those. And it's only through conversation. It's only through conversation that I think we can get there. I have a question. Oh. Yeah, I would just add, I, I don't think it's gonna come from debate either. I don't think debate is a productive way to, to unpack what's underlying our values and positions. I think it's got to be dialogue, but go ahead, Priscilla, sorry. Yes, um, I have a couple questions, but one, one would be long. Um, one is that my niece comes into her parents' home without a mask and her parents are 82 and 81. And my sister has dementia and my niece will not wear a mask mm -hmm. because she just doesn't believe in it. And I talked to my brother-in-law yesterday and said, could you ask her to consider that when she comes over and he says no she's an adult and she does a lot for the family so it's a real sensitive issue um <clears throat> I've been pretty alienated because of my political difference and she doesn't want to talk about anything uh with me about that um she's just very closed and so it's really touchy and the other issue is longer. <laughs> Probably a, an approach with that um, nonviolent communication four sentence model. Play around with it a little bit so you get the best, the best sentences that you can come up with. But if you put it on you rather than her. So, um, you know, I observed that there are a lot of us going in and out of mom and dad's house. Um, and that sometimes we wear masks and sometimes we don't. I feel very anxious and very worried when I know anyone's in the house without a mask. So own that, own your own feelings. This is about me, 
it's not about you. I'm not going to criticize you. It's about me. I need to tell you how I'm feeling, how I'm experiencing this. I need to, um, to feel comfortable and, and to, to not worry about this and not worry about mom and dad's health and possible exposure to COVID. Can I ask you, just for me, can you just wear this mask so that I feel more comfortable? And I know, I know it's about me. Um, and, and you don't have to do this for you, but could you do it for me, just as a favor to me? So make it about yourself, not about the niece, because as soon as it becomes about her and her behavior and any evaluation of her behavior, the, you know, she's going to be defensive, it's going to become politicized, it's all of those things. Oh, I know, yeah. So... Yeah. <clears throat> So that's been very helpful. That's been very helpful. Um, before we get into the longer story, I want to interject one question that came from someone else in the in our audience here from Lois. How would you deal with a person with a silent stare who refuses to engage? Mm -hmm. So the hypo emotional response, silent stare. Um, well, the, you know, the old adage, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink is, uh, yeah, that's a challenge. Um, you could use, again, try the model. I notice that when I want to talk about these things, um, that you may not be interested in talking at that time. I feel alone in my feelings and, and perceptions about this. Um, I need to understand your point of view um, and what you're thinking about this particular thing. And so I'm requesting, is there a time that would be good for you where could we just sit down over a cup of coffee and, and talk about this? So that's that four part, four sentence model again, describe, feeling, need, specific request. Um, so that might be, might be an approach. <laughs> Uh, on the mask issue, uh, couldn't you also make sure she understands that the primary purpose of a mask isn't to protect her, but to protect other people? Some people don't really understand that and how bad she would feel if she caused her grandparents, is that what who we're talking about, to, to die? It's her I mean, she might not totally understand that. Does she understand that? I don't know. I think a lot of people think it's a liberty issue for just themselves. You know, she's a, only a Fox News person, so. I'm shocked um, by that. I <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but that's a good point. I could bring that up too, because my reason when I want to wear a mask over there is to protect them. Right. Because I don't know if I've been exposed. Right. Uh, exactly. Nobody and, and my brother-in-law is a very meek uh, person and doesn't want to make waves. And um, I don't know. <laughs> good luck. Yes, good luck. Good luck. Yeah, Priscilla, you, you have your longer question ready for us? Oh, I have a longer one. So I have a, a niece, I mean, a granddaughter who will probably want to move in with me because I have space. And she has borderline personality disorder. She will not have therapy. She's angry. Um, she, her life and opinions and everything about her lifestyle is different from mine. And she has a child, which would mean I wouldn't need to do babysitting. And I've been making a list of why it would not be healthy for me to have her move in. Mm -hmm. And um, so to do that without her feeling rejected and terribly hurt is going to be a big mm -hmm. issue because she can't afford, she's separating from the father of the child, which actually is a positive move because of his emotional abusive behavior to her. And um, it's, it's just so complicated. And, mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I don't want to feel guilty about it. I want to feel um, proactive and like this is, a, is the best thing for her to and me <laughs> mm -hmm. to not move in. I would be babysitting a lot when she's working and he's five years old and he's adorable. I love him dearly. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but our discipline differences and 
um, so many things. Yeah. So you're clear. Boundary, 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 boundary issues. Yeah. I'm taking notes like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Didi, you want to play Ask Amy on this one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amy's better than I am. She's wiser than I am. A um, couple of ideas. Um, think about the both and thinking. Are there other solutions other than her moving in where you can offer support to her that you can offer babysitting two days a week or three days a week or something? So say, I love you. I want to help you. I want to support you. Here's what I think I can do. Um, if you are leaning toward having her move in, um, then articulate conditions. Mm -hmm. I would really like to support you and help you in this. I realize that if I could provide a space for you rent free, that this would be very helpful. I can't have babysitting childcare take over my life. I can't. So here's what I can do. Here's what I can't do. If you're going to move in and you have borderline personality disorder and you're not seeing a therapist as a condition for moving in, you need to be in therapy. You've gone through a really traumatic, difficult time with this breakup. You need support through this. Um, and this is going to help make that better. Um, and dialectical behavioral therapy, committing to a six week program of that. And there are ones in the area I happen to be married to a shrink because the reason I know these things. Um, <laughs> dialectical behavioral therapy is a really excellent, outstanding program for uh, borderline personality disorder. You commit to six weeks of skills training. And it's a lot of things like this, how to regulate your emotions, how to make boundaries, how to engage in conflict. Um, so uh, that could be a condition of moving in. I want you to commit to this program because this is gonna help you get your life back on the right track. Um, and there are various places again in the area where uh, she could access that, but that's- off the, So is off there a therapist you could recommend privately? <laughs> um, you know, call either the Holland Hospital uh, Behavioral Health Services and ask um, who uh, does dialectical behavioral therapy, and I think almost all of them do, or who in the area or who in Grand Rapids. I mean, they can give you other outside sources too. Uh -huh. We would be able to give you um, some contacts. So I've already made a list of other, so other possible ways I can help. And, yeah. and so, but you've included this therapy thought. Oh my God, that would help her tremendously. That's yeah. what she needs. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we've gone past uh, 11 o'clock. It's five after 11, I believe. And so uh, I think this is time to uh, say our goodbyes. And before that, of course, thank Dee Dee. Oh, thank you for all being here. Practice your homework this week. See how it goes. Try it out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Okay, bye. Thank Can you. I ask one Thank question of you after this? For, uh, if stick anybody around. wants to take and listen. Stick around, stick around Suzanne. Okay, I, that's what I just wanted to ask, though, before you left. Got me out of it. <laughs> I'll leave the class open for a few minutes. I think we're down to five know. people. So uh, whenever you're comfortable, Suzanne, I'm going to stick around to the end because I want to talk to uh, Susan afterwards. And and, uh, and okay, maybe, I'm yeah, it's just uh, just the four of us. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it confidential, whatever you say. Okay, um, I'm from a large family, and um, I'm the second eldest. And the uh, political atmosphere in our family is very divided. Well, is somewhat divided, I but they've closed off communication and I'd like to know their positions, why they feel the way they do, because there's such a variation. I mean, as being the oldest, I was gone when a lot of them <laughs> mm -hmm. were still around, you know, we're just growing up. Uh, there's, uh, there were 14 of us and I was second eldest and it was a 20 year span from first to the last. So um, how do you bring them in to talk to you about what their feelings are? I don't feel like I've been a proselytizer of my views other than 
just, you know, which I maybe did when I was growing up, but I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> that's, you know, and you don't know how that affected those that were younger than you are, because it's hard to tell. You go away when you're 18 or whatever, and they're still in high school and grade school. <laughs> mm -hmm. And is there any way you can bring them into conversation with you about your differences? Maybe to start with um, the similarities. Start with the similarities rather than starting with the differences. So um, we're all from the same upbringing, yeah. Except for when we were our separation, but of years, we were all from the same parents and had the same common siblings. memories. Common memories. Yeah. At common Those memories crazy. and and the, the memories of um, the people in your your relatives that you shared uh, in your lives, your parents, your aunts, your uncles, that sort of thing. Yeah, so I think that. I would start there because this is such a um, tense time for people around political values. Um, so start with the commonalities, initiate the conversation. And, and then I think you can say, you know, and I really do want to understand, I understand we have different values on some of these issues. And, and I don't love you any less for your values, but I just want to understand them and be able to, to talk about them and for you to understand my position, not to change our positions and change each other, but just to understand each other. Just understanding kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 And the agreement has to be taken off the table at the beginning. You say we're, we're not here to reach an agreement. We're not here to, um, we're, uh, to persuade the other person, just to understand, just to understand. Well, we each all other. are, it, we're in a family, it's not Zoom, but it's a family group mm -hmm. on, online. And yeah. we, we found that we've reached that goal at least. Yes. So, Yes. But the minute you bring up anything, it's like darts are thrown at you. And it's like, so yeah. do I have to approach the, 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 uh, the ones that I know for sure are anti what I am or whatever separately? Yes. Or can I do yeah. it in the group? Uh, if there are alliances within the larger group, I would do it more individually um, and take some of that pressure off. Well, uh, a personal connection, a personal conversation. I know two for sure. Yeah. But, I, you know, and both are females. Yeah. So we have that commonality. So, yeah. so probably smaller group rather than all 14 together. Yeah. Well, once you, lose, once you uh, grow up too, you leave the home and you start a life of your own and you take on new partners and those partners yeah. influence what your perceptions are too. Oh, so, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I wish you luck, Suzanne. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Didi, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Hope that right. uh, covered a lot of really helpful ground. Hope that gets us through. So at least some ideas for right. uh, how we pick yeah. up the pieces. Yeah. May I, may I make a suggestion? I, I got lost both times when oh. you're doing the steps of temperance. And uh, I, I was looking for the numbered steps and sometimes there were numbers and sometimes there weren't. And so I never got all 10 that I'm aware of. And toward the very end, you did summarize about eight points, but I didn't see 10. And okay. you know, I'm, I'm such a anal person that I need, <laughs> I need to, to have all 10 somehow showing at the end or something like that. If you could add a slide that shows 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, or if you could start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. <laughs> yes. Just I will do that. Just and I me. can the and numbers on them initially. And then I thought, oh, it, you know, people are going to go, oh, no, we're only on, you know, seven on the countdown oh. out of 10. What are we going to do? So then I took some of them off and left some of them on. Okay, we're making progress, but you don't know exactly where we are. But I will summarize those in a slide at the beginning next time just to. Um, or at, yeah, beginning or at the end and then leave enough time for maybe people to take quick notes to, to get that yes. thought. 
Okay. And then there was yeah. another toward the end when you had realized, uh, I think it was the one with the, um, the baboon fisherman had yes. realized with an S in it. And that's British. And I'm wondering, uh, maybe you used it when you were in Britain. Actually, the um, photograph I got comes with that, those words. Oh, it comes with it on it. I can't take them out of that image unless I white it out, which I haven't done. So um, that was somebody else's screenshot, and I got stuck with the, the whole image, and I can't separate the, the visual from the words. So I inherited oh, There are ways words. that you can, in, in PowerPoint, you can crop images, and maybe you could play, play with that. It's select the image, and then uh, there's a, uh, something that lets you crop. But, and white it out, but yes, I <laughs> thank you. I, that's okay. Okay. That, those are just really picky things. It's, this yeah. is my kind of, <laughs> okay. But <laughs> out, outstanding again, and we look forward to your uh, next sessions. Excellent, thank you. thank you. I will see you all next week. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, uh, Judy, did you need yeah. to talk with me? Hi. No, not, not with you, I guess. Um, well, I am with you at this point. I think I'm ready to go. I uh, was in touch with email with my coordinator, but if he doesn't show up, sometimes he doesn't. <laughs> and I, I'll just introduce myself if I have to, and I think I can work with it through. Do you have access to the list of names of, or how many we, we can expect for this afternoon? I can look that up if you give That would me be helpful maybe to, to know whether, I, I'm still planning to work with gallery view, I think, and just, uh, just kind of uh, read people's faces and look for their hands raised and, and do the discussion that way. Okay, I'm just doing a sort in our registration. Um, okay. It takes about one minute. It's okay, I've got time. I wasn't going to um, take anyone's time to ask this question. <laughs> I think you'll laugh at this question, but I desperately wanted to ask Dee Dee, what if you really don't care what anyone else thinks? <laughs> what if I really don't want to know why my sister can't, you know, I mean, like, like so I, I think there is a point of just resignation. Oh, right, right. Uh, yeah, right. That's the old uh, Nibor prayer, I think. Grant me the serenity to, to accept the uh, things I can change and uh, the wisdom to change the things I can or whatever and something or other to know the difference. Oh, he, that is just so true. And I right now, I just, I, I. I don't know if I'm, and, and that actually is a, I mean, I'm being a little facetious. Where is this class? Hold on a second. I'm being a little facetious, but I do think that there is a point where, where I don't know if I, I'm, I don't know if I'm in a space right now to seek to understand why somebody feels a certain mm -hmm. way. And maybe that's part of the timing issue. And I'm looking desperately for your class. Okay. Um, it could be called building community or it could be called- Oh, human nature community. and community. Yeah. Okay, that's why I couldn't find Yeah, the, the name is sort of vague. Okay, hold on one second. And there. I will tell you, it should be a lot easier to do this step. Okay. Um, how many were you expecting? About 12. I have 10 right now. Okay, well, that's fine, yeah. Um, Ten is, uh, a great, that's a great size group for a book discussion. Versus. Right, right. And, and is um, Sue Bolander one of them? Uh, Phil Harrington is a, is a coordinator. Can you read me the names? I think they're- Yeah, that I, and I can actually get you a list prior. This, it's just yeah, kind of you can send me that right list. now. 
Yeah, let me send you the list because I want to rerun the report. It's just given me fits and I don't think I can do it as quickly, but um, okay. let, I will send you that in about five minutes. Oh yeah, take your time on that. And okay. that prayer again, it's uh, grant me the serenity, serenity to, to accept, accept the things I things cannot I change, change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom, wisdom to know the difference. difference. That has given me such uh, good advice for a lot of life situations. And and uh, just there are things that you can't change. You back off from them and you don't let them bug you. Oh, it's, Judy, it's I learned taking that. taking a lot prayer. of worry off my plate. Yeah, I learned that prayer many years ago and it is lives in my heart. So yes, you are a okay. smart woman. Okay, um, um, uh, are, are you gonna be with me this afternoon or is Kim? It is scheduled to be Kim, so okay, I'm going to be getting whatever. admin done. But um, do you? Is there anything aside from me sending you this list in five minutes that um, that you I think need? We're, I think we're good. We're good. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. For Walking us through this. It's great. Okay, yeah. I'm going to leave the meeting. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.